So now let's move further. So next is, so ASIM is based on a strong foundation of co-creation. Who better to bring this enriching and inspiring entrepreneurial stories than our own co-creators, ASIM members. So this session is an interesting panel. We should talk about the art of entrepreneurship. So first we have with us Mr. Samir Kaji, who is founder and owner of Select Control Private Limited. The company is one of very known brands in India in the field of industrial measurements and control, has subsidiaries in Europe and USA and exports to over 50 countries. So, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Samir Kaji. Joining Mr. Samir, we have Mr. Ankit Mehta, who is the CEO of Idea Forge Technology Private Limited, a next generation drone system company that manufactures advanced unmanned aerial vehicles, UAVs, for defense and geospatical applications. Idea Forge has featured on 20 innovators who has changing our lives, cover story on India Today, and best product design company in the aerospace and defense domain, Mr. Ankit Mehta. Next we have with us Mr. Akhil Shahani. Akhil is the Managing Director of the Shahani Group, which runs a range of colleges in the areas like business, media, retail, real estate, sorry, real estate, finance and others. His, co his colleges incorporate global industry orient oriented education system that makes graduate truly employable. Mr. Akhil Shahani. Next we have Mihika Sampal. Mihinka is the Managing Director of Elastochemy Impex Private Limited which is into synthetic rubber and chemical. They represent various multinational companies from all over the world namely GOW USA, Nantex Taiwan, United Initiators, Germany. Mihinka Sampal. And last but not the least, we have Abhimanyu Asija. Abhimanyu Asija is CEO of Somnet which is in the business of manufacturing and trade of zinc and copper alloys, wires and casting. He has recently been awarded as a Young Entrepreneur Emerging Company Award at the International Medal Awards, Mr. Abhimanyu Asijan. So, can I request all the same panelists to begin with the discussion? Yeah, hi. Good morning, everybody. And uh, after this very soul-stirring talk that we've all heard, I think we all need a little time to settle down in our head, I think. But, <laughs> but uh, you know, what we're trying to do today, here together, uh, we all hear about the stories we've had, how we progressed in our business, where we started, how we went about doing it. This is discussed so often. Uh, today what we are trying to do is try to understand what we feel. We are not here to, uh, to give any special expertise. I think many of you are already uh, more capable and uh, uh, able to do so many things that we are in the same boat as you are. But uh, we are just trying to share what we feel uh, within ourselves. And I reflect first you know, on what I went through in my business, in my work. And as everybody asks this question, how did you you know, what did you do to start your business and why did you do business? And uh, for me, it worked out as, uh, I didn't even know I was going to start a business. I was out of college and I was uh, doing my thing. I was so busy creating uh, silly things which I wanted to see them work that it so sounded like a bad idea to go and work where they wouldn't let me do what I wanted to do. So this was the only reason I struck your passion was and things like that. It brings us to the question or uh, we ask, how much of passion is driving driving you to succeed? And when somebody who started didn't have a goal, like I didn't have a goal, and I look back and I can look at all the dots that have joined over the years, and when I think to myself, yes, I was very passionate, I was a developer, I was creating my own products, but today I find that it is not only the passion that I had in what I created, but also, I found that my lawyer is telling me, if you've written the brief, I don't need to look at it. My accountant is telling me, how is it that you find in five seconds what we've taken five days to create as an error in what we made, you know. So it's the passion that came about in doing everything that you do. And more than anything else that I take away today is 
the passion to connect. I mean, at the end of so many years, I think the passion that I feel the most is the connection I have with other people. Right. So this is my take on my journey, what it started with, what it came about today. But I, I would, I would just like to ask everyone you, you now. You know, he has a different kind of journey. He must have different start and different kind of journey. So let them also share what they, what they take this year. Uh, so, I, okay, uh, is it on? I mean, I'm on the light off. So, hi, I'm Mahumani uh, Passion for me uh, is, is the only way to grow. I mean, I, I haven't seen anybody growing in their life without any passion per se. Uh, but but uh, unlike Sameer, I never had a passion for metals. And, and that's what I do now for the living. Uh, as, as a kid in college or uh, even while I was working with the bank, uh, metals was the last thing that came to my mind in spite of my father uh, you know, venturing out into a, into a manufacturing business, which was at a small scale at that time. Um, uh, but, but, but into metals. And, and uh, many people would think this would be the obvious choice for a son to go and join the father. But, but it was my last option, uh, to be very honest, when I was in college. Uh, and, and hence I took up a job before I uh, even even joined my father's business. And uh, this was an absolute fluke, as uh, Captain Raghuram said, uh, uh, this was, we are the lucky ones that, you know, destiny has chosen to do something that, uh, uh, at this level in our lives where uh, challenges are much smaller compared to the other stratas uh, of the society. Um, so uh, I, I was actually back for my MBA uh, preps and uh, uh, just after the bank I started working with my father for a year while I was in the process of GMAT. Our organization was technically very well set, but a very small business at that point of time. Um, uh, commercially very weak. And uh, it just so happened that that's what I had studied in my business studies and worked in a bank. And it was much simpler uh, to grow this business and we grew by about 120% in that year uh, compared to working in a bank. And when I, when I saw this was growing, then, 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 then MBA plans and everything just goes out of the window because you have a venture which is growing. And, and suddenly you taste entrepreneurship and uh, how it is working for yourself. And uh, it's been uh, about eight years. Uh, uh, we, we have grown by about 600% since then. Uh, so it's been a journey of growth for us. It's been, uh, I, I feel uh, incredibly privileged and blessed uh, to be where we are and uh, you know, looking at a brighter future ahead. Uh, so uh, passion for me has been more about uh, you know, doing things well and, and being excellent at whatever I choose to do, wealth creation, is the main reason why I was in this business. And metals is something that I've uh, uh, grown to like uh, as, 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 as a byproduct which gives me you know, uh, what I want to do. So, so that's what passion is for me, but, but it drives me and uh, that's what powers my growth. I'd like to uh, sort of share um, my story and it's very similar to what Samir, uh, Samir had mentioned. Uh, sorry. So, uh, I was extremely passionate about technology when I, uh, when I was in my college and I used to implement a lot of my ideas and luckily uh, it, it's surprising sir that you had uh, that kind of uh, energy and uh, uh, passion for doing hardware uh, so long back. Uh, it was actually pretty rare uh, when I was a student who actually find uh, even in my batch of uh, IIT Bombay uh, people who were excited about hardware, people would run away from uh, a competition or preparing a board, uh, the first sign of trouble in that uh, event and you know, I would like sort of spend the entire night doing it. That was, this, the same was true for my co-founder, so we would stay up nights to try and build our boards and uh, make sure that we have something presentable out there when we go and participate in that competition. And uh, you know that passion, the same story, right? We just we just found that the jobs out there or any other offering could not give us that kind of uh, satisfaction of uh, not just being a spoke in a wheel, but being the entire uh, you know being the cog that can move the move the entire wheel and bring everything together. I think that was really something that drove us. But I think taking cue from what uh, Captain Raghuram uh, mentioned in the morning is that. Uh, one thing that uh, really uh, nodded me when I was uh, in IIT Bombay was that uh, we, we got this amazing education. A lot of public money was invested in our uh, education. And on top of that, uh, I used to go to our faculty and tell them I have this crazy idea. You know, can you give me money to implement that idea? My idea, not even a faculty's idea. 
they actually somehow managed to fund those ideas. I spent lakhs of IIT Bombay's uh, capital on my ideas when I was a student. I tried to patent on, I implemented seven or eight original ideas of mine when I was a student. So I really felt privileged. I felt that, you know, if I were the 5,000 and one thing, one and student who didn't get in this place, I probably wouldn't have received the privilege of, and, and I wouldn't have been any different from the 5,000 guy, but it's just that I wouldn't have had the privilege of studying there. And I started thinking about uh, whether uh, I'm living up to the vision with which these institutions were created, within, vision with, within which they were able to fund my ideas. And I think that was really a huge motivator for me to uh, begin my journey on, uh, uh, on a company. Uh, passion, I believe, is something that uh, you have to be passionate and you have to, if you don't find inspiration, you have to allow yourself to be inspired. And I think for us, energy and robotics were two such things. We were passionate about both not one and we chose to start with one and uh, follow through with another uh, uh, in due course of time uh, based on how our food stuffing work and everything has worked out. So that's my journey. I think you have to be passionate as a person and uh, find your inspiration. Thanks for coming. <laughs> um, so I think uh, passion for me is uh, probably
of my passion, which is education, and especially education where we're able to build uh, employable graduates because in education, you know, a lot of uh, graduates are not employable, and scale up around that and come up with something really fantastic that you can turn back to at the age of 18 and say, wow, I did that. That, in my mind, is passion. And again, it's not for everyone, but I think it works for me. You also mentioned that uh, entrepreneurship is a painful journey. Yep. So, uh, was there a you know challenging phase in your life or, or in the business when you have to sort of completely reinvent yourself? Yeah, exactly. That's true. So, and again, after uh, Captain Raman's uh, point about uh, how people in station really, really suffer, I think it's kind of yeah, challenge. What the massive is now sort of like <laughs> challenge. It's bad talking about it now, yeah. But all right. So uh, this is actually interesting because a lot of uh, the funny thing about challenges, a lot of them tend to be learning opportunities, right? So. Uh, when I uh, did my MBA Kellogg and I came back to India, I worked in software industry in the States for some time. I came back to India and I said, wow, I'm brilliant, I'm from the top business school, I work in the software industry in the States, let me start a software company in India. And I said, okay, I'm going to start it up, I'm going to apply all my high funder, Kellogg, Philip Kotler, theories into my company, I'm going to like rock it and I'm going to retire by the age of 35, become like Mr. Mariwala, and you're like, help others, I'm going to retire. Pass, pass, pass back. So, anyway, so, so the thing is, I said, okay, let me do that. So I started out, and everything that could go wrong went wrong. I mean, like, for example, I had a situation where I started with something called creating knowledge management system, which was, at that time in 2000, was a solution looking for a problem. Most companies didn't want to buy KM solutions at that time. I had problems with my people. I mean, probably I was the problem, not the people. I had my CEO investing money for my company. So after five painful years, I sort of found with the company. And what struck me at that point, I said, look, how come knowledge from the best business school, one of the best business schools in the world, was not useful in running a business? I said, that makes sense. So it really struck me that maybe academia and business are not really as well connected. So which actually started me down the path, say, can you create an education system that makes you successful for life? But I, so I think if I did not have that experience of failing in my business and saying that, okay, there's a problem with high end education, did I actually start, then start coming up with a solution that my current business, which is actually trying to solve the problems of education. But if I had that failure, it would not have uh, maybe where I am today. So maybe, uh, something you have thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that uh, today uh, I'm going through one of those, I think one of the big challenges that I have faced in my business as of now, and it's very current. So uh, I always being the designer, being the marketing person, thinking, okay, this is the strategy, you think about business strategy and uh, that's it. My wife was running the operation side of the business until about a year back. And I was looking after the design, the marketing and everything else. So this business was split into two sets of management. And when she had left all the systems perfect, in her rule, everything was on dot, in place, on time, perfect. Okay. So I thought there's a running system, everything is going fine. And uh, like I just got to do the things, every, every set situation will continue running the way it's running. It so happens over 6 months, 8 months, I'm saying, okay, this is not happening, this customer is complaining, I'm starting to dig, what's happening? And I'm saying operations, you know, you think operations, manufacturing, okay, this will take care of itself. Uh, the real future of business is like, you know, you, you plan big and you think and you execute whatever you have to do. And design and marketing are the biggest things. And this was to me a learning that I had a blind side, you know, every entrepreneur I think has a blind side. He loves something too much, maybe loves something a little too less. So when things started unraveling, I started asking, okay, why was this happening in this way? No, X, Y, Z, vehicle didn't reach on time. Why didn't the vehicle reach on time? Something else. I realized there are wheels within wheels within wheels. And it was not so easy to talk about getting operations uh, operating the way it should be operating, right? So this was a big shake up. And I understood at one point that as, you know, again, take away from what, what uh, Raghu Raman said, is that you, it's great to be on the ground with the troops inside the trenches and be with them, which is part of what I started doing now. But it was a great learning. But I can say that just at a point of time now, the, the whole thing that happened, the reason we cannot manage it is because everything we did on marketing work, everything we did on sales work, everything we did on design work, and the customers have twice the amount of orders, we don't know how to execute. So this is the circumstance I'm in and I hope I will learn a little more before I come back and see what I learned from it. But yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So I think uh, for us, uh, challenges have been numerous because uh, you know, as a first generation entrepreneur, first to even uh, you know, understand a balance sheet and uh, yeah. you know, so for me personally, you have to learn pretty much everything from scratch and 
that I think has been a challenge, but I think one inflection point that uh, once happened was when uh, we were not able to raise more money for the earlier business we were doing. And uh, we had orders on the other business that we were doing and uh, we didn't know how to get the money to execute that order. And uh, as a fresh graduate, uh, coming from a background where my dad would every on every dinner conversation tell me that uh, uh, you know you shouldn't take debt, debt is the death of you. To uh, you know, uh, so so then so so that time that trying to come up with the right solution to manage uh, what uh, what what principles he uh, gave to me in respect to debt and uh, manage the situation in the company because that was the only alternative. I think that. Mutation in mindset was, uh, you know, a clear inflection point, and probably that decision and the way that decision was taken has led to the company's survival for the longest period of time. And I think that's that's probably one of the achievements of the company that it was able to survive in a really tough environment. We said to the government, we said to the defense, on top of that, and in the face of request, what exactly do you think when you had that challenge? I mean, so the, what I did at that time was. Uh, uh, I decided that uh, you know I I'll take debt, but I'll take it only for working capital. Whenever I had uh, either uh, you know almost certainty of getting an opportunity or you know having confirmation of having getting uh, gotten an opportunity, and only then will I take debt, so that I can always cover it from my own accruals if possible. So that was something that I decided and uh, that helped me sort of till date. It's helped us uh, thankfully the privileges of uh, being fortunate of uh, the ecosystem supporting that journey has also, sure. also been there. So personally I feel that uh, for me I had a very uh, challenging time taking up the business as a whole. So in 2015 my father expired and immediately that day all the pressure was on me that you know I had to take up the role and responsibility. But uh, something from within uh, kind of triggered that and I said that you know this is the time uh, you know there are so many guys depending on me and I have to take up the baton and I decided to go for a meeting on the exact same day and the following day I was in office uh, telling my entire team that you know guys I am going to be leading you right. I had absolutely no idea what I was going to do and what direction I was going to take but I knew that you know I had it in me to kind of go right. ahead with it but the challenge was managing people so I was probably my pune was uh, as old as me everybody else uh, in the organization since it's a family owned business everybody is there since so many years you know we don't have that much rotation and uh, they think they know it all and they were like why should I take orders from a 25 year old girl who is just think she's professional because she comes from an architectural background and how can she lead me? Uh, so I had a very uh, hard time dealing with uh, and managing people but then I started applying the principle of you know if it's not getting done do it yourself and prove that it can be done and um, as I applied those principles I saw my actions converting into results and I can say uh, in the past two years you've shown a growth of 87%. So it was a good. Uh... Uh, so, so for us, uh, yeah, it's been, it's been uh, uh, a good journey as such for a company, but uh, uh, there's been, um, uh, I believe, a handover takeover within the family. Uh, you know, where the co-founders uh, sort of realize that you know, they want to do different things in life and they want to hand over the uh, responsibilities to uh, you know, people who are running the show now. Um, in which I was identified to you know, uh, take over the business uh, as far as the executive responsibilities go. Now, till the time uh, you know, you're, you're working for uh, or you're working under you have to uh, take your decisions, uh, it becomes a very, very different environment to work in. Right, because and, and 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 once it's your responsibility, you start thinking about things and uh, taking things forward as if it's your duty. Uh, you know, you, you stop detaching yourself from the company. You are not different from the company anymore because you know it's your own business. So uh, during that process, I believe uh, when the power shift was happening, uh, so as I would call it, not that big, though, not that dramatic, but. <laughs> Uh, so when, when that was happening, and I'm sure it happens in all of our businesses, uh, majorly family businesses. So we had to uh, 
uh, you know, all of us uh, have to formulate strategies of how this would be done, and, and you know, we would often disagree uh, on, on whether we should grow it commercially, we should grow it technically, we should put up another plant, or we should enter into another line of business. Everything was a decision. And it required, as a, as a, and I was just about 25 or 26 when that started happening. So as a, as a uh, uh, younger person than what I am today, <laughs> I think I was, I was more impatient, and I had to learn uh, uh, the lesson of patience and the lesson of you know taking everybody along and not just trying to hustle your way through. Uh, for which uh, the reinvention technique I used was I went for a bus ride. <laughs> so I went for a 10 day with the person I just to sort of uh, figure it out all in my head and uh, since then definitely it's been, it's been good and as, as you keep growing, as, as your decisions start paying off, I think the trust of others in you starts increasing and automatically relationships line up accordingly. So, so that's been the challenge and that's how I need it. So Shivani tells us we have five minutes left so we're going to have a rapid fire round where I ask rapid questions and Shivani fires us after five minutes. <laughs> so, so the first question uh, randomly asked, uh, what do you, what's the one thing you hate about being an entrepreneur? One night. Well, I, one. I hate, I mean he mentioned impatience, I'm horribly impatient. And I hate it when I want to tell the guy, okay, ask him, when can you get this done? It's in three days. I said, uh, you know, no, you do better than that, right? He says, okay, we'll do it in a day. I think you can still do better, you know. So maybe in an hour. I think, you know, I want it right now. Okay. So this is the only thing which I feel when I talk to other people. It really, uh, it's like true. I think I hate the fact that I have to wake up with problems. When you have to dictate that, yeah, do it this way, you know, that, that just gets to me sometimes. Right. So, uh, I realized in my journey that uh, more often than not, uh, you know, when you want to grow and you want to take the leaps, the only way to do it is to bend and grow. Mm. So, <laughs> that, that doesn't go well always, but you've got to get yourself to do it and uh, you've got to get yourself to, you know, submit to a higher thing and because you want a larger objective, right? so you've got to bend to grow. So one thing I really hate is that, and especially a lot of students, as uh, our companies grow, there are people in the company who have been loyal to you earlier, but they're not able to grow with the company in terms of skill set. And so you have to make a decision, is that do you retain them because you're loyal to them, sure. or do you sort of say, okay, pass them on to another job, to another company because of the sake of the company. And those are decisions that you have to grapple with, you know, probably almost a couple times a year. But that's one thing I hate. But that being said, the great thing about uh, being an entrepreneur, at the end of the day, you can drown your sorrows. Uh, after a hard day, we've done some new hey. So, how do you drown your sorrows? And no points for saying alcohol. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I think what I, what I do is, if I'm really messed up in the head, I go to go home and I switch on any news channel, English news channel is going on. There's so much of mess going on out there. That by, the, by the end of it, my brain has gone numb. But that's good enough. I, better than alcohol for me. <laughs> 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 I like. Binge watch or I take a walk. Okay. I, don't I think I love playing sports, so probably tennis. But at the same time, I also feel that ascent plays an important role in right. this because uh, whenever you're really upset about a lot of your problems and you meet for that meet up with everybody, yeah. you can actually pour out all your issues, and right. that's also a good way of uh, cooling down all your issues. Yeah, it is just. Uh, when I cannot do that, I just go for a drive. Okay. <laughs> so the long, the deeper the soil, the longer the drive. <laughs> cool. So I've actually got a bunch of uh, college friends who I've known for a very long time, and we uh, meet once a week, and we just sort of like blast our problems out to each other, and we sort of like you know just say that okay, no matter how bad my life is, that guy's life is worse. Of course. Then, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I won't say alcohol, but it's <laughs> like, okay. Final words. But of course, uh, uh, when you are drowning your sorrows, you get very philosophical. So what was that one line of philosophy that? Has you but stay with you. What's your best philosophy? Or what's I think what I like, I don't remember the exact words of poetry, but there is a Japanese poet called Mitsuaida. And uh, one of the lines that I like is that one step at a time, you take one moment, one step by step, and if you keep doing it consistently, you can reach the top of Mount Everest, you know. So I, I like that philosophy and uh, idea. I believe in, uh, you know, I believe in finding a larger than life aim, which will take longer than your life to build and then die for it. Cool. That's what I believe. So uh, I'm a Rocky Balboa fan. 
right? And straight from the gut, it's not about how hard you hit, it's about how much you can take and keep moving. <laughs> That's how you survive, that's the only way you can win. Okay, mine is defeat is a temporary condition and right. it's giving up that makes it permanent, so never get bogged down by anything. Okay. Well, well, mine is uh, very basically, uh, life is a game, don't take it too seriously, just enjoy the journey and you know, what happens at the end, uh, as I said, the old world that says that at the end of the chess game, the king and the pawn all go back and sleep in the same box, so <laughs> that's it. So, Shivani, hopefully, I think we've got from that time. Right. Thank you all very much Thanks. for listening to us very intensely. Yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah, I, I think yeah, I have to leave. Huh? Okay, oh, great. So, yeah. so maybe do it offline. Thanks, you.